morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our uh, session on um, social protection and rethinking social protection systems. Um, we will be discussing um, issues around social protection globally for the next hour or so, and we ha we're very lucky to have a very diverse panel with us here today. We have uh, representatives from the uh, political side. We have Minister Abulif from Morocco, who is the Minister of General Affairs and Governance in Morocco, also a Professor of Economics. And we have a prof um, Minister uh, Van Quickenborn from Belgium, who is the Vice Prime Minister and Minister for Pensions. So two different contexts um, in terms of demography, um, at least. From the business side, we have um, uh, Masen um, Darbasa from Jordan, who is the founder and uh, chairman of um, Hikma Pharmaceuticals, but also a senator in the in the Jordan Parliament. So you're providing us a bridge between politics and and the business world as well. And welcome also to um, Jeffrey Dell from um, Swiss Insurance Group. He is the regional chairman for Asia, Asia and Pacific, Middle East and Africa and also is in a Global Agenda Council on Insurance. Zurich Insurance, I hope not Swiss. Zurich. 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 Not Swiss, that's another company. That, <laughs> sorry, indeed, Zurich Insurance Group. And uh, finally, we have another bridge, who is uh, Jürgen Griesbeck, uh, providing the bridge be between business and civil society, a founder and a CEO for Street um, Football World. Uh, social entrepreneur from Germany. So we will start with just a brief exploration of the issues of social protection, challenges of social protection that we are having in our own context. We have very different contexts and I think this is a richness for the, for the discussion and we should not get too fixed in the sort of um, traditional statutory um, measures. So may I ask um, Jeffrey Dell to start. Okay, so I think as we look at uh, social protection we've got to uh, understand what the challenges are and uh, perhaps simplistically I think dealing with safety nets for those with disabilities and those that are unemployed is something that most economies can deal with. What is worrying is how do we deal with pensions and uh, <coughs> medical care, where both have fundamental drivers that are causing problems. The changing demographic pyramids are putting huge pressures on pensions. The fiscal strains that uh, much of the world is under is putting tension on it. And there are real arguments to be looked at as what, what is the right age for pension? Is it what Bismarck was looking at the last two or three years of a life? Or is it uh, what much of Western Europe started going to a retirement in the mid-50s and 30 uh, years of uh, relaxed life? Medical care has continued cost inflation issues and the dramatic rise of non-communicable diseases to deal with. Are we able to effectively ration health care? Is that something that makes sense in the societies we work in? Is it ethically sound? If you can't ration, how do you keep those costs under control and how do you fund them? And with this whole demographic uh, pyramid issue creating immense strains in many countries, and we were just talking about Japan. By 2050, Japan will have as many people over 60 as it has under 60. How do you deal with uh, benefits for the aged in a society that's reached that state of balance? Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Darvasa? For, uh, for somebody working in the pharma sector, uh, we're a company that works, we have 7,000 people. And social protection for me is looking at instances where we have uh, lack of discipline, rule of law, like what happened in the Arab Spring. We had employees, uh, you can't imagine, that didn't have, credit cards were not working, there were no banks, uh, there was no mon monetary instruments for people to survive when the revolution happened in Egypt. We as a company had to 
really look at our workforce in Egypt, how to deal with it, and how to start implementing uh, some sort of system that will be able to provide them with daily life. Not, I'm not talking about healthcare. I'm talking about basics of daily life. We're talking about uh, having a civil war in Lebanon or in Sudan where you had your employees rifted between two parts, where you had patients that you had to get products delivered for. So social protection is not only giving your uh, people equal opportunities, equal chances, continuous education, better life, health style, uh, better protection system, but is being to empower your, uh, your network in Sudan or in New Jersey. When you work in both in Sudan, Morocco, and New Jersey, and you have people uh, working in these three different environments, it's very uh, paradox what, what the systems that you have in the U.S. versus what you have in the MENA. So adapting as an international company to the local needs that you have in every country is what really, uh, I believe, is the biggest challenge. Plus, the very important fact that we work in the Arab world, and 60% uh, of the population of the Arab world is still below the age of 21. So that's another challenge that we face going forward. How are we going to create job demand for these people? How are we going to give them equal opportunities? And how are they going to be uh, globally competitive? You know, I always say there's, there, there's really no difference between a child from Finland or a child from Syria. Both are global people. Both today have the means of, of interacting with each other very quickly. And both are capable of being competitive. So as a company that's diversified like HECMA, we have to adapt our systems in order to accommodate the needs of different cultures acro uh, uh, across the globe, I would say, in, in that context. So the role that you are seeing for, for the company is indeed broader than um, a very strict. It's, it's, it's broader because uh, when you work in 42 countries, and uh, uh, fortunately in the Arab world, and I've been working 25 years, I've witnessed seven wars. This is something that you don't witness a lot in, in other parts of the world. So you really have to be adaptive. You know, and, and you have to expect the unexpected. Uh, walk, waking up one day, literally finding yourself isolated with no means of communication, no means of monetary financial tools, no means of uh, getting the next day. So how do you adapt to that? I mean, when you have a business model, you have targets, and you have uh, uh, a case where you have uh, patients in a hospital in Beirut during, uh, I, this is a very good example, I always say, when the Israelis were bombarding Beirut, uh, the hospital, Rafiq Hariri Hospital, the biggest hospital, had no anesthesia, had no antibiotics. Companies were closed, so they called one of our people. Fortunately, they had the cellular phone at that time. We had to go improvise, go to the airport, get the medicines from the airport without invoices, without anything, take them, ship them to the hospital just to save the day. So this is over and above protecting your social community or protecting uh, the values that you work with. So being adaptive and being local, and this is what I believe is a good model uh, in this part of the world. You have to be local-born companies that can grow and depend on your local community. And this is, was a very good example during the Arab Spring, what happened is that most of the companies we work in, whether it was in Libya, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, we were able to rebound in a very quick manner and go back on track because everybody was, from, was local. So we have to be adaptive in being a local company, uh, and, but an international company. I mean, thinking international but acting locally, this is what I always say. Thank you very much. Thank you. And what about um, in, in Belgium, Minister Van Quickenborn? What do you see the challenges on? social protection? Well, I think that uh, we, we are at, this, at the heart of Europe and we, <clears throat> we face uh, the challenges that uh, Mr. Riedel just referred to uh, in a sense that uh, on the demographic side uh, we have a huge problem. Actually, also security systems in, in Europe were developed in the, in the 40s and the 50s of the last century and that was at a time when you had uh, lots of young people at that time, seven people working for one uh, retired p uh, person. Today, we're at, uh, at the uh, four to one, and we will evolve towards two to one. Mm -hmm. And as our social system is uh, based on what we call repartition, so the people working today are paying for the re retirees at the moment, this uh, comes uh, under immense uh, pressure. So what I think uh, should happen is that uh, I think the solution to a lot of the problems that we're faced to uh, in social protection is a hybrid solution where you need um, a state-supported solution. 
That means that you have to have legal pension systems that are given basic pension guarantees to people. That's what we have. Mm -hmm. But um, um, uh, as the demogra demographic situation is changing, um, consolidating that is the best that we will, can do in Belgium and in other countries. You'll have to complement that with private sector solutions. And that's what we're looking at, um, making group insurance uh, 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 general uh, by uh, subsidizing schemes, uh, tax deductions, uh, and so on. And so if you complement states offered solutions with uh, private sector solutions, in the long run, I think you can guarantee a good, uh, a good uh, pension uh, system. And that's something that I would uh, like to uh, point to the people from the, from the Middle East and, and Central Asia, that is um, leapfrogging. You can learn from our mistakes. Our first mistake was uh, not uh, having a system adapted to the demographic changes as we are uh, looking at. And the second problem or the second, the second uh, challenge that we're faced uh, with is that a lot of the <clears throat> pension debt or uh, pension schemes are based on taxes on labor. Uh, labor is taxed too heavily. Uh, and um, if you look at countries like Norway or other countries that um, earmark their revenues out of oil or gas specifically to uh, building, constructing uh, efficient social security systems, you can find a solution to that. So those two challenges, demo demography and where do you get the revenues are the challenges that we're looking at. Thank you very much. A slightly different context in Morocco, Minister Fulif. Thank you. I would like to start out from what Mr. Riddle spoke about at the outset. No doubt, social protection is multi-dimensional uh, because uh, such a care uh, protects, provides uh, for people against uh, shortage in resources, whether at present or in the future. Hence, uh, we have one direction having to do with old age, another with accidents, another with health care, and another with combating uh, poverty. So there are the several dimensions uh, to social uh, protection, and uh, all these issues should be addressed with solutions. Hence, there will be problems having to do with the level these countries have attained. We cannot speak of an ideal system that applies to all countries. Scandinavian countries are very advanced. However, African countries still do not have any kind of insurance or social protection. Hence, we believe that some of the protection uh, forms and some of the challenges have to do with the global economic system that is in some kind of a crisis, and it is re-examining itself, and this impacts developing countries. The systems that exist today in the West uh, lead uh, developing countries to raise questions and say how feasible are these systems in the West because they face a crisis today and can we follow their path? The challenges in our countries have also to do with the level of urbanization for we still uh, live uh, a situation of migration uh, from the countryside uh, to urban centers uh, and uh, this leads uh, to poor neighborhoods uh, in various cities uh, and difficulties in integrating in social systems. In addition, uh, the demographic uh, problem, the demographic pyramid is also an issue. For example, if we take uh, the case of Morocco, uh, 20 years ago it was five workers to one uh, pensioner. Now it is a ratio of three to one. And this ratio has evolved very rapidly over the last 20 years. Then uh, the uh, improving uh, the uh, level uh, of uh, life or life expectancy. Now you have to work uh, 20 years. Uh, now you have to work uh, for 
you have a life uh, expectancy of 47, whereas it used to be much lower. And this means that the number of those who need health care is higher. Now, the Arab Spring has brought forth new demands, uh, new needs uh, that did not exist in the past. And uh, this also increases the level of challenges and the level of the system that Arab countries have to implement. The problems that we have today uh, would require uh, a coordinated effort, uh, a form of solidarity between those effective and active in civil society and the NGOs uh, who play an important role in our countries and in Morocco in particular. And uh, there would be those uh, who care for the needy and uh, those who would uh, care for orphans and would care for them for the whole life cycle. And uh, this would be a system that would complement what the state provides. It would also relieve uh, the burden on the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's got a natural, natural um, shift then to Mr. Griesbeck and the role of civil society and social protection challenges in that, that forum. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I mean, there were already the several points mentioned by, by my um, fellow uh, panelists here, but I'm looking actually at the social protection system from a slightly different angle. Um, my experience is based um, on working with around about 100 civil society organizations around, around the world, um, working out of 60 countries. And they are dealing with a population that doesn't have access to any kind of system. Um, so they are, in this sense, as we're discussing so far, they are not protected at all. So social protection for them means community cohesion and a safety net which is based on solidarity within, within their communities, but no access to, uh, to insurance or, 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 or safety nets in terms of systems. Um, so these might... Um, there, there are probably two levels of work of these organizations. One is just mitigating the immediate problem um, that can be landmines in Cambodia, that can be HIV and AIDS in South Africa, that can be um, homelessness or rough sleepers or drug addicts in, 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 in northern capitals. Um, so, and the second level is then to uh, um, have young people work over a longer period of time with their organizations in order to actually build pathways that make opportunities visible to these young people and what some of the opportunities would be access to the systems. Um, so what we have experienced in some countries, um, let's take England as an example, um, where one of our network members actually works with the government, in, in that case it's, it's the government, um, in order to deliver services to the government which the government is not in a, in a position to offer to, to this sort of community. Um, and, and it's based on, on a social revenue and investment model and, and it's just more efficient as what government could do in this case. Or if we're looking at the private sector, I mean there are now models out there, um, we call them hybrid value chains. It's not hybrid necessarily between public and private, but it's hybrid between private and, social, and civil society. So I, I mean there are um, opportunities out there and then we would look at social enterprise models. Um, and probably I, I know your company for example in Mexico, um, you, you have adopted such a, such a model, and yeah, this is a market, I, I think, if I'm not wrong, around about 50 million people you are not accessing currently, and in profitability terms, it would, I, I think, represent close to 2 billion. So I think um, there are opportunities um, where civil society can play a crucial role. Thanks very much. I think the ideas there that we're coming through from everybody really around kind of flexibility and, and uh, kind of reaching beyond the norm and the, the hybrid models is, is very relevant. And just I just wanted to, this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time now, working in Central Asia um, and specifically in, in the area of population aging and, and social protection. And I've been just kind of observing this structural lag. So, for example, in a former Soviet Union, where we are now with many of the bilaterals, multilaterals, designing social protection reforms or new models, it seems to me that we are still looking at the models that are stemming from the European model in, from the 19th century, which is actually very much based on formal and active 
labor market participation and immobile labor market um, force. And yet, certainly in Central Asia, just over 20 years, in a very short period of time, the informal sector has exploded. So we're looking at 40% of the people being in the informal sector now, not linked to the system. They're migrating. 20% 20 20 of Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Moldova are out of the country. They're not in the system. So the models that require or are not able to respond to the movement and the flu kind of fluid um, nature of workforce seem to be out of date. And I really wondered if we could, if, if you feel the same, if you have seen the same, are the systems fit for the world that we are living in? Both clearly we have the side, the side of the, the kind of contributory insurance based side, but also the people who have no formal link to anything. Do, and when we talk about rethinking social protection systems, how can we take the fast pace of change into con consideration and the mobility of people into consideration? And there was just a couple of examples that um, we were, we were thinking about this risk, perhaps, or becoming blind to unchanging, possibly, institutions. Um, I was, uh, someone, someone just mentioned this to me a couple of days ago, that the whole idea of a 40-hour work week was set up in the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938, which was the time when women were generally not working. So there was somebody at the home looking after the home. But yet we are still running the same system. The world, the world, labor force has completely changed. And just again going back to Central Asia, a very specific example, migration that was mentioned that has transformed the social cohesion and the family structures um, has resulted in a very widespread composition of households that only have the old and the young. And the, there's a mi huge missing middle across the region. And yet, the social protection mechanisms have not recognized this. So in terms of the older carer, the grandparent, to access support, child benefits, in a very simple way, is often impossible. Because is it this care arrangement, even though so wide, has not been recognized because the change has been relatively quick. So just a couple of examples that I've been pondering on when it comes to this structural lag. And I just wondered if we could, with the panelists, explore possible solutions or further thoughts that we have on how to, how to build, how to design models for social protection that are inclusive and inclusive will have to consider those who are out of the system at the moment, but also sustainable. And is that a um, fine balance, or, or is it? Okay. Jeffrey Dell, would okay. you like to <laughs> take that um, on? You know, the, the challenge with this topic is it's so wide ranging. There's so many issues. All of us could probably talk for hours on it. So uh, I'll try and home in on a couple of issues. I think we've already heard a theme out of everybody. We heard both from both ministers, private and public solutions working together. I think one of the key issues is learning from the mistakes of the past. We've also got to deal with promises that were made at different times and expectations that come from them. The, uh, the private sector has a critical part to play. And going back to your Central Asian story, it's very interesting that people think of Asia itself as being the home of family values and family support. In fact, a recent set of surveys done by the UN showed that uh, the highest number of people thinking that it is the duty of sons and daughters to look after their parents is actually in Singapore, where it is a, a only 20%. In mainland China, only 4% of people think it's the job of sons and daughters to look after their parents. So the traditional norms are no longer being followed. China has exactly the problem you were talking about of grandparents raising children. 50 million children in China today are being raised by their grandparents. 
So we've clearly got some mobility issues. Migration is one of the answers to some of the demographic pyramid issues we have around the world. There's cultural resistance to that, but controlled immigration is a big part of that solution. What we have to deal with is, is migration temporary or permanent? And uh, the challenges that you raised and which Mr. Griesbeck raised of people that don't fall under safety nets, the refugees, the illegal immigrants, whose duty is it to look after them? And do we want, even with those that are legal immigrants, is there a portability of entitlements? I'd suggest portability is a step too far at the moment. What we've got to deal with is let's get the safety nets in place and that we can worry about portability later. If they're well enough off, the private sector, that's us, can help with portability. Um, and I just say there's systems to look at like Australia's, uh, like Singapore's with retirement benefits where the strain is taken off. The more we can get those that are well working with private solutions, the more we can free up fiscal solutions to deal with the, uh, those that are disabled but also the immigrant minorities and bring them into play. So I see the job of my industry as taking as much of the strain as we can off the public sector, allowing public sector finances more freedom to deal with the really difficult challenges. Question to that around portability, which I agree is a, is a really substantial question. You were mentioning that the private sector might be able to support that. How, what would be a practical way of doing well, so? <laughs> we've got to sort out some fiscal challenges with it at the moment. So, portability of pension and medical care is actually quite an expensive thing to mm -hmm. deliver mm -hmm. at the moment, and many countries don't necessarily allow that because of the way their tax breaks or their tax treatment of pension funds is dealt with. So uh, I think we know all the issues. We know some of the answers, but there's a lot of work to be done to create true portability even within the private sector. And portability within the public sector is particularly challenging. Though, of course, there are some portability examples within the EU, uh, both in a positive and a negative sense in terms of residents migrating to better benefits or people taking their pensions with them to uh, cheaper environments to live. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, when you talk about a structured society, all of these things seem, and you can find ways of working in them. I'll, I'll give you a very good example. In, in Jordan, uh, not, I mean, 10, 15 years ago, overnight, overnight, the Jordanian population grew by 20% when we had the war of Iraq, for example. And we were faced with a situation where we had 20% of our population within one week coming into this country. You need the infrastructure, you need the schooling system, you need the healthcare, you need all of this infrastructure. So how do you adapt that? And uh, uh, today, I mean, uh, last week with the Syrian crisis, also we have another influx of Syrians coming into Jordan. And they, became, uh, they came in the, during the middle of the year. So a question was for us as, as a country, I mean, do you get them in the schooling system? What do you do? I mean, they, they, it's a different curriculum. What do you do? How you adapt to them? These are practical things in life. And most of the people that came into Jordan, for example, were children. So they had to go into schools. You cannot leave a child for six months without a school. So social protection goes beyond the things that you classically uh, try to uh, define in a, in a well-balanced social structure. I'll give you another, another extreme. We as a company, we have 7,000 employees, like I said. We are uh, publicly listed in the UK, so we have a regulatory issue that we have to conform with, and we have a practical issue. When the war in Libya was there, there was no government in Libya. Okay, and we had patients on products that are uh, life-threatening products for immunosuppressants. So we had to improvise, work through Malta, ship to Libya without any financial controls. Now immediately the regulatory bodies tell you you have to take a provision because you're selling basically without an invoice. You have to take a provision. 
The CFO tells you, you cannot do that. But by the end of the day, it's a human issue. Do you cut these medicines for people who are living on them? Or you say, sorry, guys, wait until you get me my letter of credit. So these are situations where companies have to interact with the local communities in partnership. The other extremity I will give you talking about healthcare insurance, in, in the Arab world, the social insure, I mean the, the, the healthcare insurance for an employee costs us around $700 a year. In the US, it costs us $16,000 a year. So you have an employee working in your company that has a $16,000 insurance, and you have someone in the Arab world that has $700 or $800 insurance. And you have to be fair, and you have to be equal, both of them. So uh, what are the parameters that you have to work in? So in practical, this is what I'm trying to say, in practical life, it's very different than what we learn in textbooks and what we try to implement. And governments, as we are witnessing a very fluid situation, at least in our part of the world, they have to improvise sometimes on a very regular basis and interact with what's going on in society in order to keep that social protection process going on. So it's quite diversified, I believe, from one system to another. In, uh, and uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, what you were talking about, you know, in countries like Finland or Sweden, where we have, uh, where you have the oil funds that will, will give you that safety net, in countries like Jordan, there's no oil, there's no water, that we have to have another kind of safety net. And this is where the private sector comes in by being able to cope with the government in, 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 in getting these alternatives. And what the minister talked about, you know, Muslim organizations in the Arab world, their biggest part of social interaction was the social community network safety. So in the 60s and the 70s, where Muslim Brotherhood uh, parties were uh, I mean, where parties were banned, Muslim Brotherhood parties were allowed to work in the Arab world purely on a social network basis. So all the healthcare, all the uh, infrastructure safety nets were provided by these when, when it hit Egypt, when it hit Jordan, when it hit Morocco. The first people that reacted actually were these NGOs. It was not the government in many of these places. So all of this put together, I believe it's a partnership. So you cannot say it's the duty of the private sector or the duty of the business sector. It's the duty of the community as a whole, how they can work together. This is a business model, I mean a practical, sorry, not business model, a practical model where I see uh, uh, the network can go forward. Could I also explore a little bit about your experience? You're working, Hikma is working in MENA and has an extraordinary access and experience in very different um, frameworks, countries that all have their local legislations. Have you seen, does, have you seen good models, basically? Uh, is there anything in MENA that we could, we could learn from? Uh. What you can learn from is you have to improvise and uh, you have to have your own social network protection, really. Uh, uh, it's so diversified in the MENA and uh, what is basically uh, written on the paper or, uh, and what is practiced is completely different. It's not in MENA, in other countries I've seen it also. Uh, but good models, basically, they end up being uh, bankrupt. And I've seen that in, in the GCC where the government was taking 100% care of everyone, then they started taking only care of their uh, locals, then they said healthcare must now be done by, for the expats by their companies, now healthcare has to be done for the expats by their companies for them and their children, and they will not give you a work contract un unless you have a medical healthcare. So as countries, deplete their resources, they have to go by the end of the day to the private sector. So that model of partnership has to go on and companies have to uh, uh, interact with their governments. I mean, I'll give you a very good example. Uh, I don't want to go into many details about the pharma industry. In certain countries, you have to sell at a cost plus or at a cost in order to sustain your business model with governments in these countries and you make your margins in other things. So in many countries when we work, we really provide some, many of the times we provide certain medicines at zero, I mean, at zero margins mm -hmm. in order to sustain the business model because it's part of your duty to have this sort of social protection for the countries that you work in. Mm -hmm. So it really, 
<coughs> I would say uh, companies have to improvise and have to work closely in partnership with the local communities and governments in order to continue the business model in many instances. Otherwise, they will be out. Thank you very much. Minister um, Van Quickenborn, how do, you, how do you see the solutions? Perhaps this is the difference between the private sector and government. You may not have the measures to be sort of or improvise so much, but of course, um, in other ways, the government response can be and should be substantial. So what, how do you see the way forward? How, what is the architecture for social protection that is well, sustainable? <clears throat> Well, I, I think, of course, I mean, many continents, many questions. Uh, uh, but um, Europe, at, at the moment, also um, is facing huge challenges uh, in terms of mobility. You, s you were speaking of migration. Well, actually, at the moment, we see real migration happening within Europe. From spats with a lot of unemployment, youth unemployment in, in Spain is over 50%. In Greece, it is. In Italy, it's over 30%. And then you have countries like Germany, uh, my country, where, where youth unemployment is pretty low. So you see a lot of, for the first time, uh, engineers out of Portugal thinking of, of migrating, of being mobile towards the north of Europe. And so, so, but the problem is that at European level, we don't have a social protection system. We have national systems. We have 180,000 pension funds in Europe active. Only 80, 80 out of 180,000 have systems that go, that go beyond national uh, borders in Europe. So um, we have, we, we're, we're faced with a huge problem that is the portability, not only in private sector terms, but also in public sector terms. How can you guarantee uh, uh, somebody from out of Portugal work, coming to work in Germany that uh, in terms of social rights, everything will be okay, especially also on the side of information, because a lot of anxiety that exists within modern state, so-called modern state, has to do with the fact that people do not know what they will get. When I go speaking about uh, with pensions, uh, I'm a pretty young guy, but I go speaking with a lot of youngsters in my country and ask them, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm not sure if I'm going to get a pension. And then I ask them, what are you going to get? Well, the answer is, I don't know. Although that information is available and we're absolutely not transparent. The first thing, when you're, when you're looking for a job, the first thing you ask or the second thing is, first thing is, is it as a funny job? And second is, uh, uh, what can I earn? I mean, that's a normal human question. Nobody asks this question. I mean, what, are, what is my pension going to be? So that's a question of transparency. And the third thing I think is, is essential is that we are evolving in Europe from what I would call job security towards career security. You, I mean, the idea of having a job for the whole of your life and staying there is gone. I mean, you have to change the systems. That means that education and lifelong, uh, lifelong learning will be at, mo at most important to, to do so. Then I would like to come to your remark about the informal economy. Uh, I'm sorry to be a little bit strict on that, but um, I, 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 I think you need flexible models and, and, and flexible solutions to things. But sit, sitting there and say, okay, we will always be faced with kinds of informal economy, I don't agree on that. I mean, at least you should have um, uh, social protection offered by the state. And it's true, uh, the work you're doing is marvelous. But, I mean, I don't want to fall into an ideological uh, twist or fight. But I do think that every state, every country, uh, has the ultimate responsibility to offer minimum social protection provided by the state. And if I look at what's happening in the United States, with all my due sympathy for the country, I, I love America, but I mean, they're still fighting about the idea, having, a, I mean, general uh, health care for everybody. I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is outrageous. This should be a modern idea for every country to have health care provided by the state at a certain minimum level. And then added to that, of course, what the private sector can do. But never accept the fact that the private sector should be there, stay there, and that the state should get out of there. I mean, this is an idea I cannot live with. And you're referring to, uh, to Kyrgyzstan, where you're working, and other countries. I mean, you should have, sorry to say that, minimal democratic rights, uh, social security setup. Uh, governments are responsible for that. So I, I'm not willing to go into the idea that there will always be informal economy. We have to adapt to that. I mean, you have respons ultimate responsibilities of, out of the politicians. 
Thank you. I think the, the point that you made about kind of very low pension literacy and just generally social protection literacy is, is very valid. And I think that we did some research on that over, over the past couple of years. And that does seem to be the problem in also in the countries in, in Central Asia, for example, I'm sure it's everywhere. People don't know. People don't know what is available and they don't know how to find the information. And often if the, if the capacity at the, uh, the government level is lower, people working for the government cannot tell that either. So the gap is often often with information rather than willingness. Yeah, and, and a thing that you see with every human is procrastination, uh, especially when you're looking about building up social security mm -hmm. rights. So you should set the default right and mm -hmm. to say, okay, you're into a system um, and, and the, the default should be uh, uh, opt out. I mean, if you want to get out of the system, then it's up to you to get out of there. So uh, it's, it's, it's an ultimate responsibility for, for governments and good administrations to look for their, uh, for their people, especially when it comes to social security. Maybe you will see my, my, myself as a socialist. I'm not, I'm a, I'm a free market liberal, but I've learned a lot from what happened in, uh, with the economic crisis in, in Europe. And so uh, uh, social protection is one of the first uh, responsibilities of, of good governments. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Brulif, um, how about you? What are your your lessons and uh, thoughts for for longer term sustainable social protection that you are just starting to invest in social protection in Morocco and I'm just interested in how, how do you identify the short term solutions that are acute youth unemployment for example and make sure that those those short term solutions are paving a way for a sustainable inclusive model Yes, thank you. I will try to comment on some of the interventions related to the private sector, and maybe I will uh, uh, shift uh, the level or carry the level to another level related to the societal and the civilizational uh, or urban aspect in social uh, protection. Number one is uh, the sole reliance on private sector in providing social security, uh, social protection, I think is not sustainable on the medium or long term because the private sector is a, co a commercial uh, profit making uh, uh, sector. But basically, Mr. Darwaz, you talked about the Libyan problem, but uh, this kind of problem could uh, uh, be repeated. But we, the, the private sector needs to have uh, sustainability so that there would be innovation, etc. But there is another aspect that is uh, related to providing uh, the minimum uh, level of uh, protection. That uh, the second problem in Morocco and most uh, Islamic countries, uh, and Mr. Riddle talked about the China case, uh, but for us, uh, the uh, cultural and social uh, system provide, uh, uh, covers large part of what the uh, uh, state would provide. Uh, let me say in Tanja, my city with inhabitants of more than one million, however, the elderly uh, homes uh, are only two. And the uh, and they are uh, kept, uh, only ha house uh, some 200 people only. In Morocco, maybe I can say that it is a shame for you want to send your parents uh, to the senior home, so nursing home. So in this less, at this particular time, we don't need the state to have such care to the elderly. That is uh, covered by the uh, by, uh, family. We have some 5 million Moroccans abroad. And this to the crisis in the United, uh, Europe and the United States, these uh, um, transfers have not been uh, uh, framed because some 80% of incoming uh, remittances uh, that they send uh, have a social nature. They are uh, being sent to the parents and to family members. So even if there is a financial crisis in Europe and in the West, Moroccans who make those uh, uh, money transfers, they still feel the duty that, for, that they should do these transfers and 
they lift a very large part of the burden, even if that family does not have any social protection by the state. Uh, and through these uh, money uh, transfers, they can cover their needs. I think we should not, at uh, this particular phase, uh, we should not uh, reduce uh, this, uh, this uh, cultural uh, dimension. Another cultural dimension, I'm sure Mr. Darwaze knows it very well, is what we call a waqf. Uh, waqf. It's a sort of an endowment. And this is a method used by the community from its private sector, and it enables the state to access several in-kind and in-cash uh, um, tools that are used specifically for certain groups. For example, in the past two centuries, there were houses for taking care of cats, and one may not, uh, um, one may not imagine such a thing. Uh, uh, stray cats are taken care of through this endowment or waqf. Uh, for example, in Turkey, in Indonesia, other countries are relying on such a system, and they have shown that they are able to progress. Another model for us in Morocco, uh, we rely on certain funds. Uh, we are not an all-rich country. However, in uh, our partnership with the private sector, we were able to have a law uh, and uh, creating a social solidarity fund. Companies that uh, make more than a certain amount of money, uh, uh, for example, 200 million dirhams, they were committed to present, uh, to submit, uh, for example, 1.5% uh, percent of their profits to this fund. And the fund supports certain families or sectors so that we would reduce poverty and the vulnerability and to increase their uh, uh, purchasing power. We use such funds in addition to other funds that we call uh, support funds, uh, basically supporting the purchasing uh, ability of families that are not uh, socially uh, covered by social uh, uh, protection uh, that would be able to maintain uh, uh, meeting their basic needs, uh, housing and food, etc. This shows that if we uh, gather all those elements of this system together, we can have a system, let me say, that is parallel to that of uh, ca the current one uh, that is operating maybe at a mid middle, uh, medium level not a very high level. Maybe it's not 100% uh, uh, coverage, especially for us. Uh, the rural uh, world is still uh, harmed because it is the one that has the least coverage. Uh, this is a big challenge for us in Morocco. Thank you very much. Mr. Griesbeck, um, going back to the, to the very large um, vulnerable uninsured informal population, would you be able to offer some, some solutions in terms of partnerships? I mean, I think I mentioned it already in mm. the first statement. I, I don't see any other solution than collaboration between the three, yeah. um, private, public, and civil society. And I very much echo Mr. Davase with what he said. And uh, two months ago, I was in Amman, and I was quite impressed how Jordan is um, kind of dealing with this uncertainty um, on a daily level. Um, I would also echo um, the Deputy Prime Minister in terms of it is a government responsibility, but that does not mean that government has to do everything. Um, and I'm back to collaboration with the private and the civil society. And I can sing a song about the USA. I'm currently living in the USA, and I'm rather not going to the doctors because it's just too expensive. Um, um, but I think there is... Um, a need to, to recognize that over the last probably 20 years there is a new industry that's called social entrepreneurship and social enterprise, social business, um, that hasn't been recognized as part of the value chain, I would say, or part of the, let's say, delivery of services, um, not only to the vulnerable, but to, if, I mean, if our ambition is to, uh, to reach 100% um, coverage and to really deliver services, um, to everybody, then I think um, this is an industry that hasn't been recognized neither by the private nor by the public. Um, and I think there are assets in that industry that is just out of reach for governments and private, which is deep knowledge of communities, aggregate the demand, 
and um, and also the the let's say the possibility to change behavior and um, towards probably then trust in government or these kind of things that are necessary in order to accept then the services of a government. Um, and at the end, I think it's not only that then the uh, um, undercovered or let's say the n underserved community does does um, does win with the situation. I think also for the private, it's a profitable way to go, and for the government, it's a way to go in order to just fulfill the mission of a government. Um, so I I can see another way um, that's not um, called collaboration of the three. Yeah. Then why is not um, why is can your sector um, social entrepreneurs why is it not bigger? Why don't we see more of it? I mean, it's very young. Um, as I said, it's just probably 10 to 20 years and really kind of um, on the map of, 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 of the global community. It's, I mean, that's the Schwab Foundation's efforts and the Ashoka's efforts and those who are identifying these kind of um, solution-driven solution entrepreneurs in terms of um, serving the, the communities. And it's just that um, we haven't yet entered into, uh, let's say, too many of these successful partnerships that then could go to scale um, as a model for the partnerships. Um, and that needs, let's say, more approximation of um, the sectors being at the government in terms of frameworks and allowing social entrepreneurs really to, to develop and the private in order to recognize, in order to um, establish and su support these industries for their own sake. Thank you. I would um, open the floor now, unless any of the panelists would like to come back to a comment or open the floor for questions. Um, one there, please. I'm, I'm Barbara Thomas Judge, and I'm chairman of the UK Pension Protection Fund. And I have a question to ask the um, to ask Jeff Riddle and also the Belgian minister. I agree that we need to have the state and the and the private sector work together to protect people. And in the UK, we're trying to have a single state pension and give people an idea of what they will get. But the problem that we have in many countries is the pensions crisis. Is the fact that we promise people defined benefit plans and we cannot afford to pay the promise. So what it's happening besides the fact that we're worried about whether we can pay the promise when the time comes is we're shifting the risk to the employees in defined contribution plans. So we're giving them some money and then we're saying really you're on your own. And that's not working out quite so well. People don't really understand what to do with the money and employers aren't being all that helpful. So what we're trying to do is find a way between defined benefit and defined contribution where, pe where the risk is shared between the employer and the employee in terms of giving people some idea of what they will get at the end of the day, but not totally rely on the employer to fund that. So I would ask the panel how you think we can do that. This is a serious question. We are grappling with it right now in the UK. Of, we're calling it defined ambition, but we don't quite know what that is. What we want to know is how do we keep employees understanding what they get, get some kind of minimum benefits, but not burden employers with big pension fund deficits, especially as solvency too is trying to apply insurance company regimes to pension funds. Thank you. Well, um, I think that um, first of all, it's true that um, in some countries you've seen, like in Holland, for example, with the financial crisis that, that um, pension allowances uh, shrunk by 7 to 8 percent. So it's true that you need a lot of protection uh, when it comes to asking the private sector to, to, to do their deal. So therefore, I think, first of all, guarantee a, a basic pension uh, to everybody as a state responsibility. And what we do is uh, the repartition scheme so that people working to get to today are paying for the pensioners of today because that kind of system is um, uh, well prepared against any financial shocks. 
It's not prepared against demogra demographic shocks, and therefore you have to reform the system, but it's well, uh, it's sustainable against financial shocks. When it comes to the private uh, sector and the, um, what I call the additional uh, schemes, you sh we see a lot of shift, uh, indeed, from defined benefit to defined contribution, uh, because it, like you say, uh, shares uh, responsibility between employees and employers. And in our tax system, we've adapted uh, uh, the um, tax deduction schemes towards that kind of plans so that there is an incentive for employers to look for those, uh, to lo those schemes. The biggest problem that we're, facing, uh, we're faced with is that uh, huge parts of our society are not participating at, that at this moment to additional uh, pension schemes. That is, pr um, most of the time, um, economically pretty weak sectors like textile business, uh, uh, restaurant business, people working there, a lot of women working there. So therefore what we are looking at at the moment is to think about generalizing the system, um, asking the private sector to set it up with all kind of guarantees, but at the same time obliging, thinking of obliging employers to uh, provide uh, their employees with uh, a, an additional a pension scheme because, like I said in the beginning, the state pension thing is something that you can consolidate by asking people to work longer, by closing early retirement schemes, but thinking that you can grow that and bring those pension levels towards very high levels is unthinkable uh, because you have to take into account the de demographic challenges that we're look at, looking at. So it has to come from the private sector, but with good guarantees where um, the responsibility is shared by employees and employers and uh, financially uh, incentivized by uh, the government and administration. So the challenges are severe. Uh, you know that uh, defined uh, benefit schemes fell primarily because the assumptions on longevity and interest rates, investment yield, were fundamentally flawed. And suddenly the risk became much too great for corporations to bear. And in many cases, they couldn't even guarantee, they couldn't even fund what was guaranteed. At the same time, defined contribution brings new risks, not least of which people tend to look at it as a lump sum. So A, they don't understand it, but B, they want to withdraw it early, spend it on something, they try to blow the lump sum. So you've got to find a way to get a happy medium. I think the answer is in reworking the way we do things and how we give certainty. We've got to go back to saying what yields and what longevity are we looking at. Longevity, the current assumptions are probably totally wrong. We probably need to add four or five years to the current assumptions because the way actuarial science works, it gets longevity wrong by definition. We need to start almost looking at defined contribution as a contribution to an annuity and uh, start looking at it in an annuity sense and you then get that certainty that people are looking for. But it's not a great answer. Yeah, but you, know, you, can't, uh, you can't fix the interest rate problem. The only way you fix that is by putting more money in. So if the annuity gives too low a yield, then there's an employer-employee contract issue that has to be resolved. But at least you've got a certainty to it. Do we have more questions from the audience or from, from the yeah. panel? Or did you want to add something? <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe so. There's a question there. Where was the question? I can probably add some, uh, something I wanted. Mm. When you ask why. Um, why there are social um, entrepreneurs or social businesses or social social enterprises are not already working more mm -hmm. with the with the public and the private? I think, obviously, in, in in some countries there are all these transparency corruption issues where NGOs try to to avoid and not go too much into, and and there is a, a perception of probably the business that NGOs are not efficient and and they are not 
um, kind of playing to the rules. Mm. Um, and I think that has to be overcome um, because it's, it's not anymore like that. Um, probably also the burdens on, on, on um, social enterprises in terms of uh, where's your business plan, where's your profitability, where's your I don't know what. Um, talking from, let's say, a government, a government perspective that are often or would be bankrupt in a private space, um, it's, it's sometimes a delicate a delicate discussion um, where I think we just have to come back to to think about what is our common purpose, mm -hmm. what do we want to achieve together, um, and we have to think about to think let's say beyond our organizational or institutional or national boundaries in order to solve problems. If we want to solve poverty, if it's only about our bottom line, if it's only about my next um, um, re-election period, then we have a problem. Um, but if we want to go for the real challenge in our world, if we want to really get to 100% of coverage, if we want to really eradicate poverty, then, then we have to think in a different way yeah. altogether. Yeah. Um, and it's not anymore our ego or our brand or our nation. It's about the problem. And do you see movement? Do you, I mean, clearly this is a model that is, is working. Do you see that it is, it is it's advancing and it's taking... I think on. at the end of the day, it's a leadership um, question. Yeah. And I think there is movement, yes, mm -hmm. and on all levels, in governments, in private, and obviously in the, in the civil society. Yeah. And there is people coming closer together, talking more and more the same language. Uh, I was, uh, talking about insurance companies, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I remember uh, in the early 2000s uh, when I went to Kazakhstan and uh, at that time we had a meeting with the president, it was semi-private government thing, and the president of Kazakhstan was saying, you know, now we want the state to start taking care of all the health care. So we're going to socialize, not privatize, we're going to socialize the health care system. At that time, in the UK, the government was saying we want to get out of the healthcare system. So these were two paradox things. If I look today at uh, the network of insurance and safety mechanisms, in, in the Arab world, the average expenditure per person, for example, on pharmaceuticals is around $24 per person. When you go to the US, it's $800. In Europe, in the UK, in, in these countries, it's in the range of $600. Now, why? It's the same medicine. It's the same medicine that you're taking in Morocco, Sudan, or the United States. Because the business model is quite different. The same, I, I'll give you a very good example. We export from Saudi Arabia an antibiotic for six cents. The other day, someone in the U.S. took that same medicine in a hospital in New York for $1.8. The same product. We, we are making a margin at $0.08. Cents. And it's being, it reaches the consumer at $1.8. Imagine how many layers and layers. Now, why do they do this in the U.S.? Because they say, we have social insurance, or we have an insurance company that's taking care of it. This is why I said in, in the Arab world, we pay 800 or 600 per employee, while in the States it's 16,000. Because still the insurance mechanism in the Arab world is still very primitive. While it's too much complicated and too many layers became in Europe and in the States. So if we look at the business model of how many layers we have between the consumer and the producer, you can really look at how you can diminish this gap. And this is why you have the pharma market, for example, uh, all of the Arab world is only 2% dollar value. It's, uh, today, we are, uh, the Arab world is around 380 million. And they spend only 2% of dollar value. It's, it's very low because the consumer in, in that part of the world is getting affordable medicines. And there is no ins insurance mechanism that's, I, I, I'm the chairman of an insurance company, don't <laughs> take me wrong. Uh, uh, so, so who's paying by the end of the day, it's either the state or the insurance or the providers. And the, the, so going forward, we should look at the structure of what will be the relationship between the community and between the private sector in that sense. 
And I believe uh, there are good social entrepreneurs that start something like this in Egypt, for example. I know of, uh, a very good group that did that. So y you can get these models popping up every once in a while, but they have to be sustainable. This is the problem of the social entrepreneur network. They're not sustainable because by the end of the day, their business model depends on someone else. They're not self-sufficient that can go along. I mean, in the Arab world, at least it started like this. I, I mean, this is our, our experience in, in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like it's, to I think there's a, a little bit of danger of blaming the insurance industry too much here. But what I'd say is we, as a group, believe that medical care, primary medical care insurance, needs to be done in a standalone company. The reason being is it's intrinsically political, is held hostage to political drives, and we think you want to keep the basics of what we do separate from that because the temptation to regulate somebody to cross subsidy is, is very high and almost inevitable. Um, I think uh, the US is the case study in how not to provide medical care. We know that the requirements that are put in place by the politicians on the insurers drive the cost inflation more than the, the insurers are trying to make margins rather than uh, be totally benevolent. You've got a culture of over-medicating because of uh, the incentives to the physicians. You've got a culture of over-medicating to avoid liability. You've got a culture of second, third, fourth opinions of surgery even when it's probably not needed because, again, that gets them away from liability issues and brings rapid income. Uh, you, if you're going to deal with that, you've got to get to multiple issues, which gets back to can we persuade politicians that health care needs to move back to a more basic coverage. Top-up can be managed in a different way. Can we persuade the public that uh, they shouldn't be able to get multiple opinions? You need to manage standards higher to do that. And all of that is in a country where, as I think it was uh, Minister Bulliff, or perhaps it was uh, you, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, talked about uh, the fact that universal coverage wasn't even available. So uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be able to solve the US's problems, but I don't think insurance is the cause of it. I think it's uh, a much bigger social and uh, concept of responsibility and liability issue. Thank you very much. We are, we are coming to an end of our session, just but Minister, um, uh, will it, do, can I have a brief? Just, just one word, I mean, um, on, on the sustainability of, of social entrepreneurs, I, I think um, some of the entrepreneurs um, are not and never will be um, financially sustainability. They are socially. Um, and others, they are very, very, very sustainable in terms of uh, if, we, if we talk about financial bottom lines. Um, so, I, I mean, we have to, to look at different models in the social entrepreneurship and social business world. And social entrepreneur does not mean that they are less entrepreneurial than business entrepreneurs. It's just a, a different way of looking at the profitability. We have two minutes left, so I will invite brief interventions from our Minister no, Bulif. And there's a question in the, in the audience as well. Shall we have a question in the audience first, and if you com complete the session? My name is Martin Kottpers, and I'm working at World, World Economic Forum. I have a question for Mr. Van Quickenborn, and actually relating to something Mr. Riddle has said about the longevity and the underestimation. I'm a German living in France, working in Switzerland, and I face actually three different retirement ages as such. I'm flabbergasted now with, of course, the, the recent election of President Hollande, who actually reduces uh, retirement age, uh, by the lack of, uh, say, a vision from the European Union to align oneself at least to something like a common pension year for members of the European Union. Can you elaborate on that? If we are not even able to fix something basic like that, how are we going to ever to actually fix something which is a bit more elaborate? Do we have a concise um, response to that? Yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, Switzerland has to become then a member of the European Union, but that's uh, something else. 
but it's true. I mean, my it's my belief, but uh, um, maybe I'm a little bit um, irrealistic at the moment, especially when you're from German. But it's my belief that there is only one way out of the European crisis. That is, uh, you'll you'll have uh, more European uh, solidarity um, and available. Uh, I mean. For sure, because if you want to keep the whole thing together and the euro, uh, you'll have to have more integration in terms of uh, controls over the national budgets and at the same time have more uh, European um, uh, regulation. Uh, I think social protection will be probably after we're speaking about the banking union and the fiscal union. In a few years' time, we'll be talking about social union. Social union will come in two phases. First phase will be about portability on the public and the private sector, and then the second phase will be about regulation. But today already you see in the country recommendations that are um, um, provided for by European Commission, today you see all, all already in those recommendations to every individual national country recommendations when it comes to pension age, linking to life expectancy, and so on. So you have a tendency toward, towards convergence, but still on a national level. The next phase will be coordination on the European level. But I absolutely, absolutely agree with you that we need more uh, Europe for that. And when I was referring to the mobility from Portugal for, to German, uh, I, I would have imagined that you were uh, not as a Portuguese, but as a, as a, a German going to France and then ultimately arriving in Switzerland, also a good example. Thank you. And yet you ma uh, level uh, of uh, life, uh, and it will be difficult uh, to have one single age for all these countries. From the discussion, it is clear that there is a complementarity between the role of the state, the private sector, and the different social entrepreneur uh, organizations. And this leads us to say it is best uh, for the state uh, to uh, provide for the baseline, the minimum uh, social protection, and the private sector will take up uh, a big part of what remains. And what the private sector cannot, uh, for certain commercial reasons, uh, then uh, entrepreneurship, uh, social entrepreneurship organizations can step in. There is sustainability in the work of these organizations because there is a transformation. So if one single organization uh, cannot cover a certain area, then another organization will fill in the place. But what I believe should happen is to facilitate the work of these organizations. The government and the private sector should be convinced that there is a need for this third partner. Thank you. I want to thank you for you for um, summarizing for me. I mean, it was clear that one of the solutions, the clearest solution coming through the discussion was indeed this partnership, that we have to step, step away from the textbook approach to social protection, that civil society, business, and governments do have to work together as a community in order to provide protection. For, for all of the members of the society, not just the poor, as you were, as you were mentioning. And issues like the crisis, economic crisis, mobility, migration, which is not going to decrease, are going to set us very, very different um, challenges that are going to require very flexible responses that this kind of community of the three, uh, three um, partners will probably respond best. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you for the audience as well.